This is lesson 5.3, solving exponential equations. In this lesson, the focus is on solving problems by modeling situations with exponential equations. Let's get started here. So it says an exponential equation contains a power with a variable in the exponent. So notice that the example that we've given here, 5 to the power of x equals 625, we'd say is an exponential equation. One strategy that we can use to solve these uses the fact that when two powers with the same base are equal, their exponents are also equal. So here's what I mean by that. Let's say I actually wanted you folks to solve this question. 5 to the power of x is equal to 625. What you can do is we can leave 5 to the power of x the way it is, but let's consider we might recognize that 625 is a power of 5. It is 5 to the power of 4. For instance, 5 times 5 is 25, times 5 is 125, times another 5 gives you 625. So because these same bases, um, both of these bases are 5, we know that the exponents then uh, must be the same. So what we can say here is that x is equal to 4. Okay, And so what we've done there, if you just want to make note, is we've uh, written as a similar base. So in this case, really, really straightforward. The, the similar base, of course, was the uh, 5 and the 5 right here. Okay, So um, let's go and try some of these examples. Uh, this lesson will, of course, finish off like I suggested, where we'll actually be dealing with some real-world um, problem. All right, example 1 says to solve. Notice that we have an A and B here. Uh, example 1a, anyway, says we have 4 to the power of x is equal to 1 over 256. So again, what I'm going to try to do here is I'm going to try to get a common base. So this one is, the base is 4. I'm going to try to create this one so it has a base of 4. Now you right, right, might recognize um, 256. If you take the square root of 256, you get 16. And if you think of it, 16 is the same thing as 4 times 4. So that means 4 times 4 times 4 times 4, 4 times would equal 256. So this is the same thing as having 1 over 4 to the power of 4. Now, if you recall, um, sometimes that we will have exponents in the denominator here. If we want to move them up to the numerator like that, all we have to do is just make it a negative exponent. So we can write this now as 4 to the power of x is equal to 4 to the power of negative 4. And lo and behold, we now can see quite clearly that x is going to equal negative 4. Okay. So that was a little bit complicated. Uh, remember the fact that if you want to move something from top to bottom right here in terms of the exponents, that we'll just uh, make it uh, negative. Okay. So let's try another one over here. We have 27 to the power of x and 9 to the power of um, 2x minus 1. All right, so this is definitely a little bit more complicated right there. Uh, in the back of my head right here when I see this question, I'm thinking, is there a common base that we could create here at some point? And what I'm noticing is that I know that 3 to the power of 3 is 27, and I know that 3 squared is 9, so I'm thinking 3 is going to be where I want to go. All right. So uh, let's attack the, uh, the, the 9 first. So I'm just going to leave 27 to the power of x like it is. I Just like I said, 3 squared is 9, so I'm going to write this as 3 squared, and then this is still to the power of 2x minus 1. All right. I'm going to do the same thing over here. Um, 27 is the same thing as 3 cubed. Okay, so we have 3 to the 3x now is equal to 3 squared bracket 2x minus 1, just like so. Now, since we have the same bases right there, we can get rid of those bases. We just have an algebraic expression right here, uh, or sorry, an algebraic equation such that 3x now is equal to 2 brackets 2x minus 1. If you use the distributive property right here, commonly known uh, around these parts as feeding the chickens, you will get 3x is equal to 4x minus 2. And when we gather our like terms, we'll subtract 3x from both sides and move the 2 to the other side. It gives you x is equal to 2. Okay, So it's an interesting one um, to see that sometimes you'll have to change the bases of both the numbers. So of course, uh, we change this base to be uh, 3 to the power of 3, and this one was 3 squared. Okay, uh, Let's go on to uh, deal with something a hair bit different. You'll notice that we now have radicals in example 2. So again, with example two, we are solving. I'm noticing right here we have two to the power of x is equal to eight um, cube root of two. And what I'm thinking right there is this is a two. I know that uh, eight I can write as, for instance, two cubed. And I have a two raised to the power of x right there. So I'm thinking in the back of my head that I want to convert everything to being um, powers of two. So I'm going to leave two x where it is. I Just like I said, I know that eight is the same thing as two cubed, right? Because this just means eight times the cube root of two. And if you think what cube root means, it just means that we have 2. And if you recall, we uh, last tackled this a uh, little bit in grade uh, 11, but uh, a lot more in grade 10. Um, 
that the uh, um, index right here is always goes in the bottom. And if there's any power right here, we go on top. But right here, we just assume it's a 1 then, so we have to the 1 third. Now, if you recall, when we had the same bases, this is some exponent law uh, review right now. When we have the same bases, we add the exponent. But you'll likely remember that to add um, fractions, you need to get a common denominator. So my common denominator right here, this is technically 3 over 1, is just going to become 2 to the power of 9 over 3 times 2 to the power of 1 third, like so. Okay? And this is going to, because now we have a common denominator, I can rewrite this if you want, as 2 to the power of 9 over 3 plus 1 third. And I think most of you would realize that this is 2x now, 2 to the power of x, uh, is equal to 2 to the power of 10 over 3. Okay? And so because the bases now are completely the same, we know that x is equal to 10 thirds. All right? uh, let's try another one over here. All right, so B right here, you'll notice, has some radicals, just like we dealt with uh, in A right here. Uh, what I'm noticing um, going on here is we got quite a, uh, quite a array of different things. We have a square root uh, raised to some power, and then we just have the cube root of this number. Uh, it turns out, unfortunately, the cube root of 625 is not a nice, perfect cube, so uh, we can't really simplify that. One thing I am noticing, and hopefully um, you might have tripped on this as well, is that 125, that's the same thing as going 5 to the power of 3, and 625, that's the same thing as 5 to the power of 4. So I'm going to try to use that information. So remember, in all of these questions so far, I've been really just trying to identify what that base is going to be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this as, I know that this is the same thing as going the square root of 5, and then just cubing it. Okay, because the square root of 5 times the square root of 5 times the square root of 5 gives you the square root of 125. All right, and then I still have the 2x plus 1 right here. I'm going to do a similar thing to this other side. I know that the, um, the cube root of this is the same thing as taking the cube root of 5 and raising it to the power of 4, right? Because 5 times 5 is 25, times 5 is 125, times another 5 is that 625, which we've dealt with before. So I'm going to raise all of this now to the power of 4. All right. Now, we still don't have um, the same base going on here, so I'm still going to do a little bit of work. I'm going to try to make, I'm going to try to get rid of um, this radical here and here. So what I know is when we take the square root of some number 5, that is the same thing as um, dividing it by 1 half. So what I can go and do here is I can say that 5 is really the same thing as, or sorry, the square root of 5 is the same thing as 5 to the 1 half. And so since I already have a 3 there, it becomes 3 over 2. All right. So uh, if you want to make note of that, what I'm using, the principle I'm using right there is that the square root of 5 I know is equal to 5 to the 1 half. Okay. Um, and uh, if we continue on right there, then I still have the 2x plus 1, like so. And this one, because it's a 3, it's just going to be, it follows the same rule, only it's going to be 5 to the 1 third. And then that is all going to be raised to the power of 4, like so. Okay. And so now if we start simplifying this a little bit, you'll notice that we finally do have the same basis. Right? Um, this one is going to be 5 raised to the power of uh, all this, and then I have this like so. So I now have 3 over 2 brackets 2x plus 1 is now going to be equal to, um, I'm just going to multiply these together, so 1 third uh, to the power of 4. Remember when you have an exponent to an exponent, you just multiply those. So that's just 4 thirds like that. Okay. So we're finally in a situation now where we can go and try to solve for x. Uh, it's up to you how you want to go and uh, do this. I'm going to use the distributive property right here and here. So uh, 3 times 2 gives me 6, divided by 2 is just 3. So 3x three plus 3 halves times 1 is just 3 halves, is equal to 4 thirds. In order to solve for x right here, I'll subtract four, or sorry, 3 uh, halves from each side. This gives you 3x is equal to 4 thirds minus 3 over 2. Uh, I'm forced to, at least at some stage here, to get a common denominator. And so in this case, I'm going to make everything over 6. This will become then 8, and this will become, uh, what are we looking at, 9. So running out of real estate here a little bit, but I have 3x is equal to now negative 1 sixth. And then finally, in order to get rid of uh, the 3 that's being multiplied by the x, I have to go and um, divide both sides by 3. So when you do that, you're left with x is equal to negative 1 over, you just multiply this denominator 6 by 3, and so you have 18. All right, so that was definitely a, uh, a more complicated one right there. Um, just to review uh, what it is, again, I'm just trying to uh, identify uh, what base am I going to be trying to attack with these, and it turned out it was going to be 5, because I realized those are multiples of 5. And then from there, um, you just got to kind of work backwards, get rid of the radicals. So I, I replace this one with a 1 half, I replace this one with a 1 third, and then uh, you're off to the races. Okay. So 
This lesson is largely about uh, trying to um, use exponential equations to solve real world problems. And so what we're going to look at now is we're going to look at uh, a question that deals with compound interest and then I think we'll deal with one that um, involves either exponential growth or exponential decay. And so I've just given you an equation right here and so we, we are going to actually use this equation in a second with this uh, first example. Uh, but I want to just go over it with you. Well, first of all, why it's an exponential equation I think it's fairly obvious because we have a variable here in our exponent. Um, but otherwise, what they've said here is for compound interest, and so for compound interest, if you don't know, that's when we put money into the bank, and when we make interest on it, it's just added on top. And so this is the best way, the opposite kind of, I guess you might say, of compound interest is just simple interest where the compounding is not added to it. Uh, but compound interest is a really great way that you can um, maximize the most out of your, your investment. Okay, so uh, compound interest, it says a principal of uh, $8 is invested at an annual interest rate of I when um, n compounding periods, uh, or sorry, with n compounding periods per year. The amount $8 after t years is given by this equation. Okay, so this is going to be our initial amount. Um, I is going to be your interest, n is the compounding periods, and then we raise the power of n times t, uh, where of course t is going to be years. All right. Uh, the next thing I want to do is just cover uh, exponential growth. You're going to see that there's going to be some questions in the uh, text. I don't think we're going to cover any examples that uh, reference this equation. But if you see this equation, um, this little note just kind of explains uh, what it's all about. Okay, but for the most part, you should be okay. So I'm going to uh, go over example three right here. Example three is using that compound interest formula that we just dealt with. So here we go. So example three says a principal of $1,500 is invested at 4% annual interest compounded quarterly uh, to the nearest quarter of a year. When will the amount reach uh, 2,500? All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is uh, with the yellow uh, pen right here, I will um, write out our original equation. So the original equation I'm just getting from the formula above uh, looks something like this. And so now what I'm going to do is, uh, with blue right here, we'll substitute in the information that we have. So it said principal. The principal, that's your initial investment. So I'm going to write that as that's my uh, A sub 0 right here, A initial, I suppose. Uh, 1,500. And then I'll have 1 plus my interest rate was 4% right here. So I'm going to have 0 decimal 0, 4. Okay, 4%. And I'm going to divide that by N. N is my uh, number of compounding periods. It said it was uh, compounded quarterly. So quarterly meaning 4 times a year. So I put a 4 in, like so. All right. Um, N, of course, is going to match. This is going to be 4. And then T is the number of years that we're looking for. Uh, that, indeed, is our unknown. So I leave it as T like so. Okay. And then uh, the last thing is that we actually know what we're trying to get to. We're trying to get to 2,500 right here, just like so. All right. So this question becomes one when, uh, or sorry, where you're going to need to use some graphing technology, at least at this point in your, um, in your understanding of this unit, to solve this. And so in order to use graphing technology, what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to uh, move everything to one side of the equation. So I think the easiest thing you'd probably agree is that if we can move the 2500 to the other side of the equation, we can set this equal to zero, and then we can go and uh, find the, the zero. So if we move the 2500 over here, we will now have um, zero is equal to 1500, uh, our brackets right here. And this raised to the power of 4t minus 2500. Okay. And now, um, I know in previous lessons I've shown you uh, the work of me using Desmos to find this, but I'm going to ask that you uh, go now and chuck this into Desmos. And when you chuck it into Desmos, you should be able to find what the zero of this function is. Of course, the zero is just where it uh, crosses the x-axis. So I'll just write that again, that you're looking for the zero where it crosses the x-axis. And what you should find is it is an x, um, or sorry, not x, I guess it would be t in this case. t is equal to approximately 12.834388 years. Okay, and because this question, if we go back up to it, says um, rounded to the nearest quarter of a year, we'd round that to the nearest quarter of the year. We can either go up to 13 or down to 12.75. I think you'd agree that uh, t is uh, closer to 12.75, and so that would be my solution for that one. Okay, so uh, these questions I think you're going to find uh, quite a bit easier actually than our first examples. And so we'll just go over one more, um, dealing with something that you guys have likely uh, maybe explored a little bit in science. Uh, uh, over the late, last couple of years um, in, in, in chemistry, perhaps, uh, exponential decay. So um, exponential decay, the definition just listed right here. Uh, let's give uh, one of these a try. So uh, we have a function right here. It says the function p is equal to 101.3, all multiplied by 0 0.88, uh, raised to the power of h. And it models the atmospheric pressure, which is represented by uh, p kilopascals, as an altitude of h kilometers. 
if the cabin pressure of an airplane is less than 70 kilopascals, uh, passengers can, uh, it says suffer, that's tough to do, uh, you'll likely suffer uh, altitude sickness. To the nearest kilometer, what altitude is the atmospheric pressure at 70 kilopascals? So um, they've given you, fortunately, in this equation, um, a bit of an equation that we can reference. So I'm going to start with that. We have P is equal to 101.3, all multiplied by 0 decimal 88, all raised to the power of H, like so. Okay. And what it said right here is it said that um, we are uh, experiencing uh, an altitude uh, pressure right here, an atmospheric pressure, I should say, of 70 kilopascals. So I'm going to substitute that in for P. So we have 70 is equal to that. And what you're going to need to do here, this one um, is a little bit easier, I suppose, or oh, I guess maybe about the same, is you're going to just need to uh, go and graph this one again. And so we're just going to use the same strategy we used last time. We're going to set this equal to 0. We'll go and find the 0. So we have 101.3. I'll multiply by 0 0.88 raised to the power of h, and we'll just subtract 70. Okay, and uh, again, uh, this is uh, a question where you'll need to go to Desmos in order to do that. Uh, so I'll just write a note here, a little note here that you'll need to go to Desmos.com in order to solve that. Uh, but once you go to Desmos.com, again, you'll be looking for the zero because we've set it equal to zero, and that should give us a, um, a value of h uh, that is equal to approximately uh, what do I have here? 2.8911. 947. And I think if we go back up to the question, uh, what was it asking us to round to? It wanted us to round um, the, uh, the value of h here, the altitude, uh, to the nearest kilometer. So we would round this to being approximately uh, 3 kilometers. Okay. So um, those last two examples um, are definitely a little bit more real world uh, ish. Uh, although the focus of this lesson and the, and the part that I think you're going to have a little bit more difficulty with is, uh, is the beginning part. So let me just scroll back to there just to remind you kind of what we covered. Um, this is just one strategy that you can use to solve these exponential equations. We're going to look at a couple different ones. And this one was just using the fact that whenever we can make the same base, uh, much like we did right here and here, um, you need to try to do that. The tough thing I think you're going to struggle with is identifying what that base is. Okay, so that'll take a little bit of practice. All right, that concludes this lesson. Thank you very much.